Hi and welcome to this Leaving Stair Higher Level Trigonometry video where we're going to cover ratios, functions and equations. So this video is going to cover examples of radian measure, trigonometric ratios, unit circle, trigonometric functions and getting the general solution of trigonometric equations. Uh, before you start this video it's really important that you already revise the basics of what you learned in the Junior Cert Higher Level course. So the Junior Cert Higher Level revision video has been linked in the description below. If you haven't already revised that, do that now before progressing. So let's talk about the measure of an angle. So an angle is made up of two rays from the same initial point. So we end up with something like this. We have two sides. We talk about our initial side and our terminal side. So the measure of an angle is the amount of rotation required to rotate from the initial side to the terminal side. And we have some scenarios here of where our angle has been placed on our coordinate grid. So an angle is said to be at a standard position if its vertex is at the origin of the rectangular coordinate system, so that's like our x, y axis, and its initial side lies along the positive x axis. So we have this scenario here, and that will be something that we're quite familiar with, having one arm of our um, angle lying horizontally. So now we're just being a bit more specific. We're saying that that center, that vertex of our angle is sitting at the point zero zero, effectively that origin, and our arm lies along the positive sense of the x axis, so along where the x axis is positive. So uh, just really quickly to revise our quadrants, this is one that students tend to get a little bit bogged down in. So our first quadrant is this top right here. So top right is our quadrant one, and that is positive x, positive y. We then move into the top left, and that is negative x, but positive y. Quadrant three then is negative x and negative y. And quadrant four is bottom right here, and we have positive x and negative y. So when we talk about our quadrants, they start top right, and we rotate anti-clockwise around. So here we have this anti-clockwise turn, and we talk about these being negative angles. Uh, don't panic too much about negative angles. Uh, most of what we do can be done with positive angles. It is possible to use negative angles, and we will see a little bit of where they can be used. Uh, but generally, we're talking positive angles. But if we move in a clockwise or if we rotate in a clockwise direction, we're talking about negative angles. When the rotation uh, goes the other way, so here's our rotation and that rotation is happening anti-clockwise, that is said to be a positive angle. Now, you might look at this and say, oh, but that's the same angle. Well, when we draw an angle, when we have our two arms, we do create an acute and an, ob or an acute and a reflex angle, or maybe an obtuse and a reflex angle, uh, but an ordinary angle, so an angle less than 180 degrees, and a reflex angle, so bigger than 180 degrees. So um, we're able to look at them in terms of one would be technically a positive angle and one would be a negative angle, depending on which way we see our rotation. So a circle could be divided into 360 degrees. So here is our circle picture. We start at zero degrees and we rotate, just to remind you, uh, in case you've forgotten, we're rotating in an anti-clockwise direction. So there's 90 degrees, then 180, then 270, and back to zero. It follows that same direction of our quadrant one, two, three, and four. So what we're going to talk about now is a new type of measurement, and that measurement is called radian. So um, before we do this, I would just suggest that make sure you know how to change your calculator between degrees and radians. You should, depending on your calculator, have something which lets you know either it says or at the top or ID if you're in radian measure. Or it might say D or DEG if you're in degree measure. Make sure you're in one of those two. There is a third measure on the calculators, but we're only ever going to deal with degrees or radians. 
So uh, a radian is the measure of an angle at the centre of a circle subtended by an arc equal to its length in radius. So first of all, let me explain the subtended. So basically it's just a fancy word which means that an angle at a particular point where straight lines from its extremities are joined at that point. So basically a radian is the measure of an angle at the centre of the circle subtended by an arc. So basically the lines are coming in from either end of that arc. And if you look at that picture there, we have radius or and the arc length or, and that's what creates our one radian. So building on that, the circumference of our, of our circle is two pi or. So that's something you've probably been using since primary school. The area, uh, the formula for a circumference of a circle, two pi or. So basically that's saying it's two pi times the radius. So basically, Breaking down our definition, which says, well, if the arc was or, then that's one radian. So if we're saying two pi or, there must be two pi radians in one complete revolution. So that means 360 degrees, one revolution, two pi, one revolution. That creates this idea or this um, link between radians and degrees, which means two pi radians equals 360 degrees. Having that pi radians must be 180 degrees and having that again pi over 2 radians must equal 90 degrees um going i suppose to our four points we had on our previous slide we can say that 3 pi over 2 radians is 270 so how you would probably work to that is well 90 degrees to get to 270 multiply it by 3 pi over 2 radians multiply it by 3 and that gives you 3 pi over 2 radians. So this is what our new picture looks like. We still have degrees but now we're talking radians. So I suppose well why radians? Radians can be very very useful and helpful when we're working um, in certain areas. We're going to use radians quite a lot obviously in this trigonometry section but we're also going to see it quite a bit when we work in the calculus section so we're, when we go back to calculus we're going to see how the radians kind of fit in there and our link to radians so it's just a different way to measure the angles and I suppose it can be seen as a little bit easier depending on what the question is so I'm going to draw your attention to your formula and tables book on page 13. So there are actually four pages for trigonometry. It starts on page 13. We go 13, 14, 15 and 16. You probably have really only seen page 16. That's the one that has Pythagoras on it um, and it has sine, cos and tan. If anything, sometimes students don't even use that page at junior cert. So what I'd like to point out on this page is a really, really handy little table that appears at the bottom. And what it gives us are some of the main um, values for sine, cos and tan for some of the main angles. So we have 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees and 60 degrees. Uh, what's really nice about this table is it also gives us um, radians. So this line here hmm, actually gives us radians. So here we have our uh, just, uh, we have our pi is 180. We have 3 pi over 2 is 270. They also give us 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees in radians. Um, what I like about this particular table on page 13 and why I'd suggest to students to have it open is, well, one, it's a, it's a lot quicker than going to your calculator um, for answers. It also gives us a really, really nice way to move between degrees and radians very, very quickly without having to worry about is our calculator in the right mode? Because that can make a huge, huge difference. And you'll know as you start to work, if that happens to you, you'll see very quickly. Um, the numbers the, the difference in the numbers it's huge so having this page open in front of you means you're not going to be as worried about changing between uh, degrees and radians so it makes life a little bit easier uh, it also gives us a really uh, well a kind of an estimate for converting radians uh, to degrees and for degrees to radians but what we're going to do is we're going to think about the fact that 
2 pi equals 360 degrees and 180 degrees equals pi. So we're going to focus on this part here and we're going to use that for a really, really accurate conversion. So let's use the fact that 180 degrees equals pi radians. So if you want to convert from degrees to radians, multiply the degrees by pi over 180. So really what you're doing is you're multiplying it by pi, and you're dividing it by 180. So the opposite is then true if you want to move from radians to degrees. We're going to multiply by 180 degrees and then divide by pi radians. So let's work with some of those. So example one, converting between degrees and radians. Express 2 pi over 5 radians in degrees. So to work from radians to degrees, what we're going to do is we have 2 pi over 5. And effectively what we do, we multiply it by 180 degrees over pi. So our pi's cancel. 5 goes into 180 degrees at 36 times. So 3 and 3 left over, 36. So that is 72 degrees. So part 2, express 210 degrees in radian. So we have a 210 degrees. So what we're going to do, we're going to multiply that by pi over 180 degrees. Let's cancel um, the zeros. 3 goes into 18 six times, three goes into that seven times, and we get seven pi over six radians. So already is fine for radians. So now let's quickly look at the formula and tables book on page nine. And there are two formulas here that are really useful. And those formulas are linking to the arc and the sector. So the first formula is L and the second one is A. So a, sorry, so the L, so we have two formulas here. So L is equal to or theta, or L is equal to 2 pi or theta over 360. So that is the length of the arc, which is this here. And the first formula gives it in degrees, and the second one gives it in radians. So the second set of formulas are A, so the area of the sector. Again, we have one for radians and one for degrees, and that is for the area. So let's work with these formulae now. So the radius of a circle is 8 centimetres. So that's my OR. Uh, finding the angle in radians at the centre of the circle subtended by an arc of 10 centimetres. So what we're using is L is equal to OR theta. They've told us the length, which is L. They've told us the OR, which is 8. So we have 10 is equal to 8 times theta. So theta is 10 divided by 8, which is 5 over 4, or if you prefer, 1.25, and that's in radians. So then it says the length of the arc if the angle subtended at the centre of the circle is pi over 4. Now they didn't say it was radians but given the fact that there was pi in it we can assume then that is again radians. Part I was also radians. So again we're working with our L is equal to or theta. And we want the length of the arc or is 8 pi over 4. So the length is 2 pi. So now let's talk about the unit circle. So the unit circle is a circle with centre 0, 0 and radius 1. So this is our unit circle there, so-called because the radius is 1 unit. So you can see some points on it that are quite obvious. So if it has a centre 0, 0 and radius 1, we have our point 1, 0 here, our point 0, 1 here, our point minus 1, 0 here, and our point 0, minus 1 here. So uh, this simple circle is an easy way to work with angles and ratios. When I talk in ratios, I mean my trigonometric ratios. So here is another example of a circle where, well, this is still the unit circle. We can see our radius here is given as length 1. So it says let P, X, Y be any point on the circle as shown. And we have a triangle here where we just have O, P, 
PC and it's a right angle triangle. So we drop a line vertically down from P to create that right angle. So we have this triangle here. Uh, if that point P is XY, that gives us our X along the X axis and Y this vertical height here. Uh, it's a unit circle, so we have one as our hypotenuse in this triangle. So working with our sine cos tan, so our theta is here, this becomes opposite, this becomes adjacent, this is hypotenuse. Um, how do you remember sine cos tan? So if you're using sa katoa, or if you're using any little phrase to help you write that up so we can see it. So if we work out cos adjacent over hypotenuse, that's a, adjacent is x, hypotenuse is 1. So x over 1 is cos. Okay, so that's my adjacent over hypotenuse. x over 1 is just x, so it actually gives me cos of theta is just x. Uh, similarly, we can work with sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, and sine of theta is y over 1, so sine of theta is just y. So therefore, the coordinates of p, instead of being x, y, we could actually say in this unit circle that they're actually cos theta, sine theta. So what we have here is sine theta is the y coordinate of p, cos theta is the x coordinate of p, and then we end up with tan as the gradient, um, or another word for gradient is slope okay, of OP. So just take a look what that looks like for a second. So there's P and here's our angle. So as we move that angle, um, as we move P around, what we're seeing is we're getting a bigger, bigger angle. Um, but each of those points can actually be written as cos theta, sine theta. So the point P can in each case be written as cos theta sine theta where theta is the angle between the positive sense of the x-axis and the line OP. So bringing you back to your formula and tables book again on page 13 I'm actually going to focus on this little diagram here and what we have here is actually our unit circle. So we have a unit circle given with the angle A. It gives us the point on the circle, which is cos A sine A. It gives us the four points on the circle that we'd already pointed out at the very start. So 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and 0, minus 1. Um, and basically what this tells us is when we have the unit circle, this x-axis is actually the cos axis and the y-axis is actually our sine axis. So we can do a lot with this unit circle and it can help us to answer a lot of different questions. So the last thing I wanna point out on this page before we move forward is this formula here, which is the tan of angle A is equal to sine A over cos A. I wanna work with this a little bit more just to explain where we got this idea of the slope um, because cos, and sine, really obvious, well, hopefully really obvious from this unit circle. I want to talk a little bit more about tan. So the formula is tan is equal to sine over cos. So just for us to get a better understanding, I just has, have a little right angle triangle here uh, with my angle A marked. So here is my opposite side. Here is my hypotenuse. And here is my adjacent. So if I'm talking about the sine of A, so I have, I use Sakatoa to help, Sakatoa or whatever rhyme you use, it's perfect. So sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cos is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Here I have sine A over cos A. Remember that line here means divide. So if I say sine A divided by cos A, I'm going to have opposite over hypotenuse divided by adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, when we divide by a fraction, instead what we actually do to make it simpler is we multiply by its reciprocal. So we multiply by the fraction flipped. 
So what we get here is the hypotenuse is cancel and we're left with opposite over adjacent, which is actually tan. So this thing here is proven on this sheet here. So what that means is tan is equal to sine over cos. And when they say sine over cos, because we're talking about effectively the y over the x, that becomes the slope of the line. So tangent, tan, slope, that link has been there. Hopefully you've already seen that from junior search. When we talk about tan, it's another way to say slope. I'll demonstrate that for you here on this triangle. If we were talking slope, we talk about rise over run. So if I was talking about the slope of this line here, now in green, I talk about rise over run, which is the same as opposite over adjacent. So when we talk tan, it is another way to say slope. And in this unit circle, it is a slope of OP. So O being the center, so 0, 0, and P being that point on the circle. So we'll talk about this a little bit more as we work through, but just to be aware when we're talking about tan as sine over cos, the formula itself comes from our log tables, page 13, but we've worked through our proof here now. So what I have up here in the top right hand corner is just a little bit on our quadrants is again. So we talked about that at the start of the video, but first quadrant, top right hand corner, and then it goes second quadrant, third quadrant, fourth quadrant. So here's my unit circle. And what I want to talk about is this idea of a reference angle. So every angle in the unit circle has a related reference angle and the reference angle is always acute. So the reason we work with acute angles is because that's what we've always worked with. It's much easier to work with. And if we can bring everything back to a simpler acute angle, it makes all of our questions very easy. When I talk about the first quadrant, I'm talking about this angle here. That angle is already acute. Okay, so angle is already acute. And that means the angle that we have equals the reference angle. So it's not a big deal. Everything is the same. Second quadrant. So we're actually moving like this. Now, my reference angle is actually this angle A. Our actual angle is this angle theta. So our reference angle A, that is equal to 100 and 80 degrees minus my actual angle theta. So the reference angle is this acute little angle which we find in against the positive x-axis. So in the third quadrant, we have this angle theta here. It is a reflex angle. So our corresponding reference angle is this one here. So how we would work that out, A, is going to be our theta take away 180 degrees. And finally, in our fourth quadrant, we have theta that is this angle here. Our reference angle is this little angle here. That means my reference angle is equal to 360 degrees take away theta. So we can always work out this acute angle, this reference angle, no matter what size angle we're given. So this is it in summary. So what we have here is our theta here is our little acute reference angle. And something else interesting pops up from here. And it's this idea of well, where are sine and cos and tan positive and negative? So remember my y-axis and my x-axis. X-axis is actually the cos axis and y is actually the sine. So here in the first quadrant, our x and y are both positive. So cos and sine are both positive. Remember our little formula, which was tan is equal to sine divided by cos. That means to calculate tan, it's a plus divided by a plus, 
so tan is also positive. So that's quadrant one. Uh, in quadrant two then, over here, we have, well, the x-axis becomes negative, so cos is actually negative. The sine is still positive. Uh, to get tan, we divide a positive by a negative, so it will be negative. So that's our second quadrant. Uh, third quadrant down here, we have, well, cos is still negative. Our sine is now also negative. Negative divided by a negative to get tan. So tan will actually be positive down in this quadrant. And our final quadrant, quadrant four, we have cos is positive, sine is negative, tan is positive divided by a negative, so tan is now also negative. Okay, so we're able to see, depending on which quadrant it's in, whether sine, cos, or tan is positive or negative. So in short, we're able to do this um, C A S T. What that stands for. C stands for cos is positive, A stands for all are positive, S stands for sine is positive, and T stands for tan is positive. So there's lots of different ways where you can remember this. Um, cast, I think, is the easiest, C-A-S-T, uh, starting from the bottom and working around, but whatever way you can remember it. Uh, this can all be worked out very easily, especially using page 13, if you get stuck in your exam. So let's look at an example of using the unit circle to do some calculations. So uh, find and third form, first of all, sine of 120. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch this in. So let's say 120. Well, let me draw on this. So it's about there. So there's my 120. So 120 degrees. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm instead going to use my reference angle. So because the whole thing should be 180, that means this angle here is 60 degrees. So that means my reference angle is 60 degrees. Now, I also need to understand um, whether it should be positive or negative. So we have C is positive, so cos is positive, all are positive, sine is positive, and tan is positive. So over there, sine is positive. That means the sine of 120 is equal to the sine of uh, 60 degrees and they said in third form so you can put that into your calculator if you want but what I would suggest having an opening in front of you is page 13 of your log tables and you can go straight to sine of 60 degrees and that gives me root 3 over 2. So then it asks for cause of 225 so remember if it helps, this is 0 degrees and 360, this is 90, this is 180, and then this is 270. Then speed is 200, so kind of confused students. So there's my angle here, and that's 225. That means that the acute angle I want to work with is this little piece there. So it's whatever is left over after the 180 so you've 180 to there so that means this angle is 45 degrees that didn't come out too great so let's try again 45 degrees now before I do anything I need to understand should it be positive or negative negative so cause is positive all are positive sine is positive tan is positive so that's negative so cause of 225 so it's actually going to be a negative answer of cos of 45 degrees because down in that quadrant so quadrant three i know that actually only tan is positive so the others must be negative so sine and cos i go into my log tables page 13 cos of 45 degrees so that gives me minus one over root two if you're using a calculator it rationalizes the denominator so that will give you uh, root two over two so you should get an answer something like there if you're using your calculator uh, but I will be suggesting page 13 just for ease so now express in third form 
cos of negative 135 degrees. So we're talking about this negative angle again. So remember we talked about this at the very start of the video. If we're going anti-clockwise, that's a positive angle. And if we go clockwise, that is a negative angle. So let's look at where negative 135 is. So I'm moving this way and I'm going to move that way at 90 and not quite 180. So I'm going to go, I'm going to be somewhere here. Okay, so that's my negative 135 degrees. Okay, so a few different ways we can work that. If it's negative 135, we're actually looking at this angle here still as our um, reference angle. So if that's 135, all 180. So that means A is 45 degrees in here. Before we move forward, we need to understand is it positive or negative? C A S T. We're talking about tan being positive in this quadrant. So cos is negative. So basically, cos of minus 135 degrees is the same as minus cos of 45 degrees and that gives us minus 1 over root 2 um, or if you're in your calculator it will rationalize the denominator and you get root 2 over 2. Um, you can also work with this uh, slightly differently but we're going to work specifically with the unit circle for now. So part two, if sine of x is root three over, minus root 3 over 2, find two values of x where x is between 0 and 360 degrees. So the first thing you're going to do is I'm going to put in my CAST because that's all I kind of know at this point. And I'm going to identify the two areas where that could be true. So it cannot be in the first quadrant and it cannot be in the second quadrant because both of them have positive signs. So basically then where I'm talking about is I'm going to be somewhere either in the third or fourth quadrant and that's going to give me my two values. So we need to figure out now the reference angle. So sign of my reference angle A is equal to root 3 over 2. I'm still working on page 13 and actually I look at page 13 and I find that A, my reference angle, is equal to 60 degrees. So I know I'm now talking about something in here where my reference angle is 60 degrees and I'm also talking about something here where my angle here is 60 degrees. So in quadrant 3 I have 180 degrees plus 60 degrees and um, so x is equal to 240 degrees. In quadrant 4 I'm going to have 360 degrees minus my reference angle which is 60 degrees so x is equal to 300 degrees. So there are my two possible answers. Um, if you put that straight into your calculator and did sine inverse, you're not going to get your two values. And that's what's so important about the unit circle. Um, what we've done so far up to junior cert is we've kind of just focused primarily on the first answer. We've always dealt with acute angles. We have no such thing as a negative angle and everything is very straightforward. Now we have a lot more options and there, we know a lot more. So it's important not to revert to old ways uh, if you can and really to embrace the unit circle and to understand that there are lots of different angles that actually can give you the same value. So talking about angles giving you the same value for sine, cos and tan, we're going to focus a little bit on trigonometric functions. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, you've kind of seen this idea that as I move P, theta is getting bigger. But that point P will always have the point cos theta, sine theta. And uh, tan of theta will then be the gradient or the slope of OP. So as this turns, we're going to be able to create actual functions for sine, cos and tan. So let's do sine first. So what we have on the uh, x-axis 
here on the right will be theta the size of the angle and y will then give us um our value for sine so moving through this we're focusing on sine which is our y value so working through it we get our points here and what we're finding is we get this lovely shape where it creates a wave that peaks at one, that goes down to minus one, and that takes 360 degrees to rotate fully. So it goes from the start back to itself. Um, it goes through one full rotation. And the thing about this is it can keep going. So it can go for another 360 degrees and another 360 degrees. So we can build this function where theta can get bigger and bigger and bigger. We could extend that to go into negative angles. So no longer are we just focusing on this one rotation, but this can be extended to include however many degrees we would like. We can do a very similar thing for cos. So remember, cos is like our x-axis. So our focus on this is we come down and we come back up. So again, we're getting this lovely rotation happening, which creates this lovely curve on our um, cos um, on our cos graph here. So. Uh, looks kind of similar to our sine graph, but has some distinct differences. The first would be that sine will always start at kind of that middle line. So zero, zero effectively. Um, cos of theta is always going to start up at either the minimum point or the maximum point or minimum point, depending um, on our translations of it, but it will never start at the middle. Uh, again, this will take 360 to do the full rotation and we can extend our theta to keep going. So that graph goes on again, like it will keep dipping and coming up and down and up and down and so on. Now, tan is going to be a little bit different. So that is our slope of OP, so our slope. So if you think about it here, there's my slope getting bigger 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 until we get to 90 degrees now what's the slope of a vertical line so actually the slope of a vertical line is undefined so we cannot put any point there so we have an asymptote there so we go and now we're going negative getting positive and again we don't have um we cannot define the slope at that point there and we go through again so we get this kind of very different kind of shape than we've had before and we have what we call a discontinuous graph because there is a point where there is no value for the graph so 90 degrees 270 and multiples of those so again that theta could be extended and this pattern could be repeated again and again and again so just some terminology around our function. So we have the period. So that is the length of time it takes to make one full rotation. And it can easily be measured as peak to peak, but you can measure it in whatever way you like, as long as you take a full rotation. So for the basic trigonometric graphs, the period is two pi. Now I say basic, like the ones we've just seen, and that's before any transformations um, get applied. So the frequency is one over the period and for basic trigonometric functions it's given as one over two pi. Uh, we're going to see how that changes slightly as we move into the transformations. And the range of the function, uh, first of all the amplitude is like its height from center, okay, so the center line to the peak, the amplitude. So therefore the actual range, so from min to max, that's like twice the amplitude. So when we ask for the range of the function, we give our minimum point and our maximum point. For basic sine and cos graphs, it's minus one to one. For our tan graphs, because they can take any value, it'll be negative infinity to infinity. So here are our graphs and we have sine, cos and tan 
We have our periods, our all two pi. We have our range for sine and cos, our minus one one. And for tan is minus infinity to plus infinity. And we have our asymptotes here as well on tan at 90 and 270. That means that there are no values for tan and 90, tan and 270. And if you want to throw that in your calculator, and what you're going to get out of it is an error. Think of tan like your slope. So basically we're asking what's the slope of a vertical line? And we always say that that is undefined. We were never able to get tan of 90 degrees um, when we were doing junior cert because we were dealing with 90 degree, well, we're talking right angle triangle. So if I have a right angle triangle, the other angle couldn't be 90 degrees because then it wouldn't be a triangle anymore. There would be no third angle. So just talking a little bit about transformations of these graphs. So the transformation, we really only have to worry about uh, sine and cos, not so much tan. Tan, there's other questions that can be asked um, for tan, but really the focus is going to be on sine and cos. And we're going to do some exam questions and you're going to see that that is where the focus is. Uh, the general graphs basically have a sine and x. So for example, there is a coefficient in front of sine. So what that does is it stretches out, just like putting um, a constant in front of any function that we've seen before, it stretches it. So what that changes is its range. It goes minus a to a. It should be minus one to one. So therefore, if you multiply one by that a, it's going to give you minus a and a. The period also changes. So putting n in front of x, what it does, it actually um, kind of squeezes the graph together. So it actually creates this compression. And that's going to give us a new period of 2 pi over n. So that's how quickly it's going to it's going to move through its full rotation. So it's going to move through a little bit quicker. So just be aware of that. So the two pieces, and the good news is it works the same for sine as it does tan. So there's my n and there's my a's. So here, a cos nx, there's my n, there's my a's. So when you have an idea how it works for one, you'll have a great idea how it works for all. Um, it'll make a lot more sense if you see it work through here in exam questions. Let's take a look at some exam questions. So first one I'm going to look at is the 2010, it's paper two, question 5b. So now we have seen trigonometric functions appear, paper one, paper two. Uh, paper one would be the functions, paper, paper two would be trigonometry. So like they could appear on either and they have appeared on both. So the graph of three functions are shown below and the scales and the axis are not labeled. These are the three functions, cos of three x, 2 cos of 3x and 3 cos of 2x. So notice that these are all transformations. So some of them have um, a coefficient, so a constant in front, and they all have a change to how quickly they're moving. Now, what you should be able to pick out straight away is the range of all of these. So this one, because it's cos, it's going to go minus 1, 1. Here, because it's 2 cos, it's going to be minus 2, 2. And this one is going to be minus 3, 3. Now looking at my graph, if that's 1, 2, 3, and that's minus 1, minus, oh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, minus 2, minus 3, straight away we figured it out because this thick black one here, which is f of x, that is starting up at 3. So that will be 3 cos of 2x. Uh, this really close together dotted one that ends up here, uh, g of x, that's going to be 2. So that's 2 cos of 3x. And that means that the last one will have to be cos of 3x. Okay, so another way you could look at this is there are two that seem to move at the same um, kind of flow, as in they cross the x-axis at the same points. That means that their period would be the same, and that would have to be these two here because they're both 3x 
okay so they're both cos of 3x so they're moving um a little bit quicker than the cos of 2x. So remember we said putting a number in front of the x there kind of compressed, it compressed the whole thing. It made it move through it a little bit quicker. So the period of the function, um, instead of being 2 pi, so the period, I'll do it in a different color. So the period of both of these is going to be 2 pi over 3. The period of this one is going to be 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So that's how quickly it rotates. So I'm actually going to deal with f of x first. So it starts up at the top. I trace it down and it ends up the top. So this line here is its full rotation. So that's actually pi. And it goes, so that's 2 pi. So that gets me something quite quickly. How quickly the others rotate, so it starts up here when I follow it through and there's its rotation. So that one here is 2 pi over 3. So it's kind of like 2 thirds and then there's 4 more boxes till it's pi. So I'm going to divide that into 4 more boxes and that's pi over 3. And four more boxes up from pi. One, two, three, four. So that's four pi over three. One, two, three, four. Five pi over three. And two pi. And um, we can split it out even further if you want. Um, but that will be sufficient for the question. So let's look at another example here and this is from the 2014 again a paper two and it's question five part a so the diagram below shows the graph of the function f of x equals sine of 2x so straight away when i see sine of 2x i know two things i know the range is going to be minus one one that's not going to change and my period is going to be two pi divided by 2, so that's pi, that's how quickly it rotates. And I can see that there, look how quickly it rotates. On the same diagram above, sketch g of x is equal to sine of x, and h of x is equal to 3 sine 2 of x. So this one very straightforward, so we minus 1, 1, and it's going to have a period of 2 pi. So let's do that first. I uh, just try to keep it all. I'm going to do this one in like a blue. So then we'll be able to like see it. So it's color coded. Uh, sine means it's going to start zero, zero. It's going to rotate. It's going to do one full rotation in two pi. So basically it's going to move up. Get my pen back. It's going to move up about halfway. So it's going to hit my maximum point here. It's going to cross the x-axis here. Uh, one, two, three, four. It's going to hit its lowest point here. And it's going to come back up here. So you're going to get this idea here. If I can draw properly on the computer. Okay. So that one there in blue is g of x equals sine of x. So the next one I'm going to do, if I'll do this one in green, is 3 sine of 2x. So the first thing I have is, because it's got 3, it's going to go down to negative 3 and up to 3. So that's going to be my min and my max. And the sine of 2x means it's going to have a period of 2 pi divided by 2, so a period of pi. So it's actually going to go through the same points as the original one here. So I'm going to go through these points, uh, but my difference is it's going to move up to be 3. So that maximum point is going to go there, minimum point here, maximum point here, minimum point here, maximum point go up and it's going to go down up 
just needs a little bit. So up to here. Excuse the drawing on this. Very hard to draw on the screen. But you can do something a lot better. If you're working through this question yourselves in your papers. And up here. And that is h of x. Equals 3 sine of 2x. So there are my sketches. So um, we're going to look at solving some equations now. And just to some to, some words that are thrown around when we're in trigonometry is this idea of equation and identity. So an identity is an equation that's true for all values of the variable for which the expressions are defined. An equation is a mathematical statement that is true for only certain values of the variable. Uh, generally, the difference for us when we see it is we're asked to solve an equation. We're not asked to solve an identity because it doesn't matter what the value is. It is true. So we're going to work with our identities. There is a separate video which works through trigonometric identities, working with them. And um, so I have that video along with the video looking at sine rule cosine rule and 3d trigonometry they're all linked below if you want to look at them so this video we're going to deal with equations so you might be looking going oh i don't really get the difference so hopefully now this idea of an identity you're doing something very different with it when you're asked to solve it'll always be an equation so uh, i'm going to work with some examples from the paper again to solve these trigonometric equations so 2018 paper 2 question 4 part a so find all the values of x for which cos of 2x is equal to minus root 3 over 2 so the first thing i would suggest that you do is that you basically change that 2x to something like an a the reason i say that is students tend to get a little bit like Actually, do you know, I'm going to use theta here. So students tend to get a little bit ahead of themselves and divide when they shouldn't really be dividing. So you just need to be very careful. So one thing I find that really helps with that is by changing that to x. And we will come back to the idea of x, but just say it's theta for the moment. Um, so minus root 3 over 2. OK, so now I'm going to sketch out my unit circle. And I'm going to say, well, there is C, A, S, and T. So two quadrants where cause is negative and it's going to be, so it's not there and it's not there. So it must be those two quadrants. Um, so now I talk about, well, look, before I start working with the quadrants, let's work with the acute angle, which will be positive. So if cos of a is root 3 over 2, then a, my reference angle, is going to be 30 degrees. So this is my reference angle. So I know that I'm going to be working in, and I'm going to sketch this out again. I'm going to be working here, and I'm going to be working here. And in both of those, I have a 30 degrees here and 30 degrees here. So in my quadrant, but I'll go. So that's one, two, three, four. So in quadrant two, um, theta is going to be one hundred and eighty degrees minus thirty. So that is one hundred and fifty degrees, and Theta is actually 2x. Well, actually, I'm going to hold off doing that for one second. For one second. So, that's 150 degrees. So I said, just be careful because we just get a little bit... Um, we move just quicker than we should be moving. So, part three or quadrant three, we have theta is equal to 180 degrees plus 30 degrees so that's 210 degrees now um yeah what we would kind of tend to do at this point is we'd sub in 2x divide by 2 have two answers that's great however we need to be a little bit careful um 
And the reason we have to be very, very careful in this particular question is because of this 2x here. And because of 2x, think about what that meant when we were doing our functions. Like our function kind of squeezed together, it compressed, which means it moved quicker. So usually we would have two negative answers for cause in between 0 and 360. Because we now have 2x, there's going to be four answers. So I'm going to get four solutions. Okay, so that means two that I usually get, but because I have two x here, two by two is four. So how I work with this is I say, well, as well as being 150, theta could also be 150 plus a full rotation, which is 360 degrees. So that means for us, that's 510 degrees. I'll start boxing these. There's one answer for theta. And that's the second answer. It's still quadrant two. It's just a rotation later. Um, there's my 210. But theta could also be 210 plus a rotation, which is 360 degrees. So theta could be equal to 570 degrees. And now what I can do to finish it is say uh, theta is equal to 2x. So 2x equals 150 degrees. So x equals 75 degrees. So that's one answer. 2x is equal to 10 degrees. So x is equal to 105. Second answer. 2x is equal to 510. Now that is not between 360, 0 and 360. When I divide it, I get... To uh, 55 degrees, and my last but not least, 2x is equal to 570. I'll write this so we have a little bit more space, and that means x is equal to um, 285. Five degrees, and there are four solutions for x. X two five five and two a five. So just be very careful. Um, this way I like the substitution at the start instead of just putting in two x because it's just it's just too easy to divide that across by two and sometimes students divide it across by two and then add 360 and that's not going to give you the right answer you have to add the 360 before doing that division by two so that substitution i find really helps if it doesn't help look that's absolutely perfect and um, just make sure you're getting the four correct answers so let's look at another example. So example eight, solving this trigonometric equation. Uh, so this is from the 2015 paper two, question five, and it is find all the values of x for which sine of three x is equal to root three over two. So the first thing we can do is we can look at um, this little piece here, which means x is somewhere between zero and 360. Now, sine is positive, and we know that there are two quadrants where that happens. However, because we're dealing with sine of three x, that means in total, we're going to end up getting six solutions. So there should be two, but because we're dealing with three X, three times two, that gives us six solutions. So it's good to have an idea where we're going with this. So um, just like before, I would advise you to actually change that to theta. Just stops us dividing too early. So we get root three over two. So I'm going to sketch out my unit circle and we get cos is positive, all are positive, sine is positive and tan is positive. So we are looking here and here. So quadrant one and quadrant two. So we're going to use our um, reference angle first. So we're going to say, well, sine of our reference angle A is the positive version. This is already positive. Three over two. I'm using page 13, so sine of what is 3 over 2, therefore A is equal to 60 degrees, and this is the reference angle. So there are two quadrants where this happens, where sine is positive, so we have quadrant 1. So 
that's actually not too bad. Um, all we're going to say is theta will be equal to the reference angle. So that's 60 degrees. Um, but we also know that we're going to have to deal with it when it rotates once. So 360. So that is 420. And when it rotates a second time. So that's 60 degrees plus two rotations. So two 360s. And that's 720 plus 60, 780 degrees. So there are three answers from quadrant one. We look at quadrant two. So um, in this quadrant, our actual angle will be 180 degrees minus my reference angle A, which is 60. So that's 120 degrees. That's one answer. Then we'll look at the second rotation. Well, the first rotation just add 360 degrees that's 480 degrees and the second rotation is 120 plus 2 times 360 so 3720 840 degrees so um here's our six answers for theta 3 4 five six and then to finish that off we're going to figure out now our x so we have 3x equals 60 degrees therefore x equals 20 degrees so that's answer one we have 3x equals 120 degrees therefore x equals 40 degrees so that's our second answer 3x equals 420 degrees so x equals 140 degrees 3x equals 480 degrees so x is 160 degrees 3x is equal to 780 degrees x is equal to 260 degrees and 3x equals 840 degrees so therefore x is equal to 280 degrees so there are our six answers so again that substitution just makes this a little bit easier we have all of those answers and i would advise you just to um really clearly show these answers you can lay this out a lot better when you're working um in your papers or when you're working in your copy make sure it's all very very clear so now let's look at our third example so this example is a little bit different for two reasons the first is theta is in radians so we're no longer working with degrees so that's important and the second is that they don't give us a range of values for our angles so we don't know how many answers we need um, because it just says here theta is an element of or so it's all of our real numbers um, so what that actually means for us is when they don't give us a range of specific values so it's saying all the values this is called the general solution okay so we need to be able to work this through to get a general solution um, the logic is not very different well it's just the exact same logic at the start and it just turns a little bit different as we work through our answer so first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to use my replacement a substitution here they've already used theta so i'm going to use x so cos of x equals a half i'm going to drive my unit circle i have c a s and i have t and I'm dealing with cause being positive, so I'm looking at quadrant one and quadrant four. So I'm going to use my reference angle. So I'm going to use A as my reference angle, and that is a half. And I can figure out that my reference angle, using page 13, remember we're dealing in radians, is 60 degrees, and that is pi over 3. So I haven't had to mess around my calculator or anything because I'm dealing with that page 13. Very, very handy to use. So this is my reference angle. Now I know my reference angle, I'm going to go to uh, quadrant one. And here I know that my angle is actually equal to my reference angle, so that's just pi over three. And in quadrant four, 
I know that it's usually 360 degrees minus my reference angle. Uh, 360 degrees is 2 pi minus my reference angle is pi over 3. Again, like use page 13 to help you to figure all this stuff out if you need to. Um, you can sketch out something to help with figuring out how to get the actual angle using the reference angle. And I just need to do a little bit of clean up here. So that gives me 5 pi over 3. Um, you can use your calculator to help you. I change 2 pi into 6 pi over 3, take away pi over 3, which is 5 pi over 3. So that gives us two solutions. Now, if we were getting specific solutions between a range, or well, for a given range of values, we would then be able to start putting in rotations. Now, we do want rotations here, but we don't know how many we want because we want them to go on pretty much forever. So what we're going to talk about here is we're going to say, x is equal to pi over 3 plus some rotation so each rotation is 2 pi so we see this as 2 n pi so when i sub in a value for n we'll be able to get any rotation so starting with zero it would just give me pi over 3 putting in one it would give me the first rotation two will give me second rotation and so on so anytime i want the general solution we're either going to put in 2n pi or 2 pi n, whatever way you want to write it. Um, that's for radians. If it was degrees, we'd be talking about n times 360 or 360 times n. And this gives us our general solution. Now, we're not finished. Um, so we first need to define n at this point point so n is basically any positive or negative whole number so we can say where n is an element of z and um, we're nearly finished remember we didn't get x in the question ours is 3 theta so we go back to each of our solutions and we now go 3 theta is equal to this pi over 3 plus 2n pi so theta is going to be everything here divided by 3. So that becomes pi over 9 plus 2n pi over 3. If you really, really want, um, we can turn that into a single fraction. You don't have to. So it becomes pi plus 6n pi over 9. And that can be simplified if you want by pulling out the pi 1 plus 6n over 9. So any one of these three pieces is absolutely fine to give you the general solution. So I would probably leave it like this, but if you want to do any cleanup, that's absolutely fine. So that's equation one. And we go back and we do it for the second one. So 3 theta is 5 pi over 3 plus 2 n pi. So theta is equal to 5 pi over 9 plus 2n pi over 3. And again, just make sure you're defining that n, where n is an element of z, so it's positive or negative whole numbers. So that gets us a general solution to this equation. So, um, just be careful with the general solutions. Again, I like the idea of substitution, that x going in instead of 3 theta at the start, because again, it's so easy to divide too early. The division is the last thing that happens to get the actual values, either the general solutions or the actual values of the angle. So just be careful. Remember, if you're dividing earlier on and then adding in rotation, something is going wrong. You need to do the rotations and then the division. So now we're going to look at three questions and um, they're all exam based questions from um, one is from the educate sample paper. We have one for the GEB mock, a one for the exam craft mock. The first two are a bit more straightforward and um, because they're section A questions, 25 marks. 
and uh, they're working with solving equations and working with functions in a bit more straightforward kind of way but there's some interesting pieces on it that's why we're covering it and uh, the last question from the exam craft mock uh, the 2018 mock it's a section b question which means it's a longer style question and it is showing the application of this of what we've learned in this video, this idea of solving, the idea of functions and applying it to a real world scenario, which we're seeing more and more in the papers. So there are three very good questions that we're going to work through now. So the first question is, if tan of x is equal to minus a half, please take a please place a tick in the quadrants, the diagram on the right where x could be located. So um, if we go back to our unit circle, um, we know in this section the cause is positive. Here all of them are positive. Uh, here sine is positive and here tan is positive. So the two places where tan is then negative is here and here. So <clears throat> Without using your calculator, evaluate the tan of 330 degrees. So if we take a look at this diagram that they gave us, 330 would be somewhere in around here. Okay, so there's my 330 degrees. Um, that would leave me with a reference angle here of 30 degrees. go back to blue so that's 30 degrees however it's not just equal to the tan of 30 it's going to be equal to minus the tan of 30 because of which quadrant it's in so uh, the tan of 30 if we go to page 13 because that's what it's saying refer to the information on page 13 and um, I'm basically not using your calculator <clears throat> so if we go to the page 13 and we look up 30 degrees for tan it gives us 1 over root 3 perfect now um if you were to do that on your calculator so if you put into your calculator tan of 330 you will get the same answer but it will look slightly different so there they will be able to tell that you didn't use <clears throat> page 13 if you put it into your calculator what you get is minus root 3 over 3 now that's coming from the fact of minus 1 over 3 has a third in the bottom and real realistically we should generally not have that happen so we rationalize it by multiplying above and below uh, by root 3 which gives us the answer from the calculator okay just in case you're double checking your work but this is using page 13 as requested. So, part B, using the grid below, plot a graph of y is equal to tan of x for x between minus 90 and 270. Use your calculator to work out y to one decimal place. So, putting that into the calculator, these are the values we should get. Notice that you won't be able to get a value of the tan of minus 90, the tan of 90, or the tan of 270. So that's really, really important. Uh, there is no there is no function at that point. There is no value for y at that point. If we are then to plot it, we should get something that looks like this. I've drawn in the three lines where there is a break in the function. At this function, the tan of x is a discontinuous function. It means that um, you must lift your pen in order to draw it. So it's not a continuous function. You can't just draw it without lifting your pen. It happens um, at kind of the 90 degree interval and the 270 degree interval and in rotations after that. <clears throat> so after 270, it will happen again 180 degrees. So we get this kind of shape here, which you should be familiar with. It then asks, is y equal to tan of x a function from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 um, all the way into the real numbers? Explain. And just to note that these round brackets here are um, not including. So you're not including here pi over negative pi over 2 or pi over 2. So um, I suppose there's a few different ways that we can answer this. And what I will be talking about here is the vertical line test for function. Vertical line test. Now, it passes the vertical line test. And what that means is 
<clears throat> and you do need to explain it. So a vertical line can be drawn. between so well sorry between minus pi over 2 which is 90 degrees uh, sorry minus 90 degrees and pi over 2 90 degrees and it will hit the graph once and only once therefore it is a function so <clears throat> tan of x is a function it is what we would call discontinuous but it is a function and in between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 in that section there it is continuous and if I draw a vertical line anywhere it will hit the graph once but only once so it is a function so next it asks what is the period and range of this function so the period of the function is how often it repeats so that's 180 degrees or if you want to work in radians it's pi over 2 and the range it goes from minus infinity to infinity uh, remember when you're using um, infinity we always use the round brackets to show that infinity is not included so the last part then says find the solution of tan is equal to minus root 3 so tan of x is equal to minus root 3 so drawing out my unit circle here I get my C A S T and where is tan negative? And we kind of already worked with this. It's these two slots here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, let's work instead with the reference angle, tan of A, where that's equal to root 3. And working out, I'm actually going to use page 13, but you can, of course, use your log tables as well. That gives us 60 degrees. Notice that because they've given us this in degrees, we are working in degrees. So my reference angle is 60 degrees. So I could put that in here. There's my 60 degrees. And there's two other options. Um, well, there are two options where it's equal to minus root 3. So we have this quadrant here where this piece is equal to 60. And this quadrant here where this piece is equal to 60. So working in the second quadrant. And working in the fourth quadrant so in the second quadrant my x is going to be 180 degrees minus my reference angle which is 120 degrees in the fourth quadrant it's going to be 360 degrees minus my reference angle which is 60 degrees which gives me 300 degrees and that gives me my two values for x um, when tan, when tan of x is equal to minus root 3. So question 2, find the general solutions that satisfy the equation 2 cos of 3 theta is equal to minus 1 and hence solve the equation in the domain theta is between 0 and 2 pi. So there's a lot going on in this question so let's start off with what we have. So 2 cos of 3 theta is equal to minus 1 so the cos of 3 theta is equal to minus a half. Now, to ensure we don't do any division before we need to, the easiest thing to do is to let x equal to 3 theta. So instead, we're going to look at this as the cos of x is equal to minus 1 over 2. Now, um, because it's negative, we're going to use instead a reference angle a, which is equal to a half. So now we get that a is actually equal to using page 13 we get pi over uh, 3 now that is actually 60 degrees but they have asked us here clearly to work in radians now i've used page 13 to get pi over 3 however if you want to use your calculator that's fine just make sure it's in radian mode so now i'm going to go to my um unit circle and i have my c 
A S and my T. So here are the two places where cos is negative. So my two places where cos are negative is my second quadrant and my third quadrant here. So now I'm going to work through and figure out these two solutions. So um, <coughs> coming back, I know that if I have this angle here is pi over 3. Um, I have an angle here that's also pi over 3. And to work it out in the second quadrant, I work with the fact that this is 2 pi, this is pi over 2, this is pi, and this is 3 pi over 2. So my second quadrant is pi minus pi over 3, which is 2 pi over 3. The next one is my third quadrant. And my third quadrant, the angle is here, pi over 3. So this one is pi plus pi over 3, which is 4 pi over 3. So that's my first two values of x. Okay, so that's x and x. So x, I'm going to put it up here is 2 pi over 3 and x is also equal to 4 pi over 3. Now if I want to turn that to a general solution what I would say is 2 pi over 3 plus n times 2 pi and here x is equal to 4 pi over 3 plus n times 2 pi where n is an element of 0, 1, 2, blah, 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 all the way up. So that's accounting for all its rotations. And that's my general solution of x. However, they want our general solution of theta. So we have 3 theta is equal to this, 2 pi over 3 plus n 2 pi. And 3 theta is equal to 4 pi over 3 plus n 2 pi. Now, to get the general solution of theta, we're going to divide everything across by 3. So that's 9 plus n 2 pi over 3. And theta is equal to 4 pi over 9 plus n 2 pi over 3. And that is my general solution for theta. Okay. Sorry. Now, try that again. So that's my general solution for theta. Now, uh, they want then specifically the solutions between zero and two pi. So any angle has two in the, in the majority of cases, um, apart from a few exceptions, it has two angles uh, between zero and two pi. Because we've now put in a three theta, there is now 3 by 2, which is 6 solutions. So let's go with it. Let's first of all look when n is equal to 0. So theta is equal to 2 pi over 9, and theta is equal to 4 pi over 9. When n is equal to 1, theta is equal to 2 pi over 9 plus uh, 2 pi over 3, which would give us... Um, 8 pi over 9, yeah, and here we would have um, 4 pi over 9 plus 2 pi over 3, which gives me um, 10 pi over 9, 6, yeah, perfect, and then the last two will come from n equals 2, so theta is equal to 2 pi over 9 plus 2 times 2 pi over 3 and that should give me 14 pi over 9 and the last answer for theta is going to be 4 pi over 9 plus 2 times 2 pi over 3 and that equals to 16 pi over 9. So there are my six solutions for theta which link up between um, 0 and 2 pi. So the diagram shows uh, two points on the graph the function y is equal to f of x. So we have a few little bits here that I want to mark on my graph. 
So it's important to see that this is my y-axis and here is my x-axis. That's my zero point. Now, this has a nice little point on it, so I want to mark that on my x-axis. I don't want to mess up the straight line too much. They've told us here this is pi over 2. And we have another bit here. So notice that pi over 2 can be split into three pieces. Okay, so if I have pi over 2 and I divide that by 3, it's the same as pi over 2 multiplied by a third. So that gives me pi over 6. So this first bit here is pi over 6. Uh, the next one is 2 pi over 6. However, if I have 2 pi over 6, uh, that actually simplifies to pi over 3. So that gives me pi over 3 here. Okay, so we can see what we're going up in now. So this one here is 2 pi over 3. And this point here, linking down here, is 5 pi over 6. And this one is pi. So we're able to break this up as such. Um, it's very useful if you can put um, numbers onto your x-axis um, or values so you can see what's going on. Um, it first of all then says, uh, state whether f of x is a sine or a cosine function. So the first thing we want to look at is where does it cross the y-axis. So on the y-axis, um, the point that we have is 0, 3. Therefore, it's a cosine function. Um, and the reason is sine will always pass through 0, 0. Okay, so it is a cosine function. It's not an ex it's not just cosine. There's some little changes to it, and we're going to look at that in the next part. So write down the period and the range. So the easiest one for us to do is the range. So the range is the maximum point to the minimum point there. So if this is three, every two block means one. So this point here is actually minus one. So our range goes from um, minus 1 at the bottom to 3 on the top. And what I'm just going to write here is note it's not symmetrical. And that's going to be really important as we move on to the next question. So this is not symmetrical, so that's a big deal. Uh, the next thing we want to look at is the period. So how does it repeat? So it repeats when it's back up here. So it has taken 2 pi over 3 to repeat. So if we take a look, if we take a look here, um, that's where it starts. This is where it ends, and that gives me 2 pi over 3. Um, and we're going to use that. So I'm going to use the word normal, but a normal period when it's just... Uh, the cos of x um, is 2 pi. So therefore, this it must be the cos of 3x. And that's important. Okay, so this is cos of 3x. So now it wants us to find the equation of the function. Now, this is just a little bit tricky. Um, we know that I've just said it, it's going to be the cause of 3x. That's important. However, the actual range is different. So there's definitely a value a here. And because it's not symmetrical, there's a constant that has been added on. So there's been some shift up and down. So effectively, if we wanted it to be symmetrical, we would have to bring the graph down. So by one value. So if I brought every value down one, so every y value is reduced, my range is then reduced to being minus two to two. And that's more like what we need. So 
Effectively, what's happened is the actual function itself has been shifted up once. And if you go back and look at your diagram, they've shown us where kind of that horizontal middle line should be. And it's the dotted line. And if you have been marking in your values of y, it appears at 1. So that means our c is 1. So we have cos of 3x. And when we reduce the range because of that plus 1 to minus 2, 2, that will tell us that there's a 2 in front of the cos of 3x. So that's really, really important. If you look through the work solutions, what I've done is I've worked kind of through it logically, I suppose, so if I'm not explaining it, how would you figure it out? Um, but um, hopefully this all makes sense from the graph. The idea of that plus 1 at the end is just a little bit different. But it really what should happen is when you're looking at that range and seeing that it's not symmetrical, you should know, OK, this is going to have some kind of impact. So now we have our f of x, which is equal to 2 cos of 3x plus 1. And we want to find the function um, where x is equal to 100 pi. So we get 2 cos of 3 times 100 pi plus 1 which is equal to 2 cos of 300 pi plus 1. Now, there's obviously a lot of rotations here. So what we're going to do is we're going to see, well, look, how many rotations are there in 300 pi? So we're going to divide that by 2 pi. So there's 150 rotations. Um, and because it, 2 pi kind of divides evenly into this, it's actually finished on a rotation. So what we end up with is 2 cos and this is equivalent to 2 pi plus 1 which is equivalent for cos is the cos of 0 plus 1 now the cos of 0 is 1 so we get 2 times 1 plus 1 which works out at 3 uh, you can of course use your calculator and if it's in radian mode it will work like that but it's important to be able to reduce the angles and I'll show you here so we have 300 pi and we're going to divide that by 2 pi so it means there's 150 exact rotations if we got a decimal there it means mean there were so many rotations and then some and it's that and then some that we want to figure out but here there's just 150 exact there is no um there is no remainder so we know that actually they're full rotations therefore 300 pi equals to 2 pi so full rotation or 0 as well so remember your unit circle this point here is equal to 2 pi but it's also equal to 0 so let's look at our final example. Um, this is a trigonometry exam question. It was from a section B, so it was worth 60 marks in total. And it was a much more practical kind of question than the ones we usually see. So a Ferris wheel has a radius of 22 metres and is boarded from a platform that is 2 metres above the ground. The 6 o'clock position of the Ferris wheel is level with the loading platform for the viewing cars. So a viewing car reaches the height the highest point of the revolution after three minutes, the movement of the wheel can be represented by a sinusoidal function. Uh, when this function is graphed, the horizontal axis represents time and the vertical axis represents height of the first viewing car as it continuously moves around. So some things we need to talk about. So first is sinusoidal, this function here. Now, um, again, remember that this is a mock, but um, when we talk about a sinusoidal function, it is a curve that describes a smooth periodic oscillation. So just to be really clear and really careful, uh, this could mean sine, which is kind of the obvious one, but it can also mean cause because it's cosine. So either of these are valid here. Um, it wouldn't be tan because tan doesn't have an oscillation as such. Um, it is disjointed, it is discontinuous. So we're talking about either sine or cos. Um, we are to ask in part A then, in relation to the graph of the movement, write down the equation of the midway line. So just to have an understanding here of our heights. So it starts here and it told us that this 
is two meters above the ground. Its center point here is then where it's turning from. This is 22 meters and then this is 22 meters, both because it's um, that just represents the radius. So there's my maximum um, and there's my minimum. So they're just distances for the moment. And if I was to think of these in terms of an actual number line, this here would be two this will be 24 and then this one here will be 46 so that gives us a better sense of where we are on the number line as opposed to distances so it says in relation to the graph of the movement write down the equation of the horizontal midway line so my midway line is going to go through here and what is that equation? So it's a horizontal line. So the equation is a little bit simpler than r y equals m x plus c. Because it's horizontal, it's actually a constant. So it is a straight line, but it's a constant. It's a constant um, horizontal line, which means it's going to be in the form y equals, and in some value, so y equals 24. Um, and really 24 meters, but they couldn't work with you. They couldn't dock you marks for that if we're talking about a function. Uh, so that is our midway line. So seemed a lot more difficult than it was. So part B, write down the range of heights a person will experience during one full revolution of the wheel. So this is talking about how high does it go and what's its minimum point. So we saw that the lowest point it is two meters above the ground and then the highest point is 46. That came, and they are both meters, and that came from our diagram on the previous page. So both of those parts are worth five marks. So then write down the period of the graph representing the movement of the wheel. So it tells us that it takes three minutes to get to the top, um, which means one re full revolution. So one revolution is going to equal to six minutes. Okay, so... Um, our period is how long it takes for one revolution. So in this case, our period is simply equal to six minutes. Again, another five marks. So during mathematics class, two students are deciding on the type of graph that should be used to represent the movement of the first wheel. Tom thinks the graph is a sine wave while Joan believes it's a cosine wave. Do you agree with Tom or Joan? So basically, do we think it's sine or cosine. So the best thing to do here is to do some kind of sketch. So here is my Ferris wheel, here is my x and my y axis. They told me that my y axis is representing the height and the other is representing time. So when time is zero, we're starting at the bottom and we're moving up, 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 up. So we're starting, here is my starting point. What I get is something that looks like this. So it starts at two and it goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, now, what I would say about this particular question, if we go to the syllabus, it doesn't mention anything about the transformations moving up and down for the sine and cosine rule or for the sine and cosine functions. Um, it's good to see it, but I don't think this would be something that we would see on the paper. They specifically talk about this compression um, and a very, uh, and the symmetrical movement. But in this case, we're not going through zero, zero. Now, basically, one of the things you would have maybe learned is the sine graph always starts at zero, zero. Now, that is not necessarily true. It will start at zero, zero if the x-axis is our center line. Now, here, as we already figured out in part A, our horizontal center line is actually 24. So when we put in that center line, we need to make a decision. Well, if our graph starts at that center line, then it's a sine graph. If it starts at either the top or the bottom, it's going to be some version of a cosine graph. So based on this movement and what we have, this will actually be a cosine, um, a cosine graph. And the answer 
and the logic i suppose you would say is that the fact that it doesn't start at that midway line so remember sine will always start at the midway line and cosine will always start either above so at the top the maximum point or at the minimum point so we agree with joan because we think it's cosine At minimum point sine always starts at midway point okay and that was actually our 10 marks um, in that exam so part E says, uh, one of the functions below can be used to represent the motion of the Ferris wheel. Using your answer from A to D, choose the correct function and fill in the values for A, B and C. So we've decided that it's a cosine rule. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, it's definitely not this one and it's definitely not this one. So that just leaves us two to work with. So what I've put in here is how our cosine graph usually looks. So notice here that we usually start in a cosine rule at the maximum point and in ours we're starting at its minimum point. That means that it's flipped. That means that there is going to be a negative put in front of our cause in order for it to flip. So we're looking at this one here because of the minus b cos ct. So we have a few things that we need to put in. Now um it really is up to you where you start. For me, I would talk maybe about the shift. So A. So A is its shift. So it has shift up from where? Well, the center, the center or midway line should be zero. And actually, we're shifting it so that it's at 24. So actually, this shift, this A added on at the start is going to be 24. Um, we want to talk about the amplitude, so actually just this height here. So this height here is 22, and we should have a mirror image down here of 22. For any cause or sine graph, that should be 1. But actually, when I put a constant in front of my sine or my cause, that will stretch out the amplitude. So B here is given by the amplitude, so that's minus 22, and it's going to be cause of something t so we need to work out that number in front of our t so ct so that's the last piece we need to work with and we're going to for that go back to the idea of period so i'll work here for a second so remember our period is equal to six so our period is usually two pi but when we have any number put in front so like that c we're going to end up with 2 pi over c. So, oh, sorry, that should be c, 2 pi over c. So this equation here, we're going to solve that for c. So for us, that gives us 6 is equal to pi over 3. So this gives us pi over 3t. So that is our function f of t worked through. So we're dealing with a lot of what we've already seen, but putting it together. Uh, just to note as well, like I said, that adding in the a at the start, officially that is not written in the syllabus that's required, but it's good to see it just in case. It's not a hard part to deal with. And um, so if it did come up in a mock, You'll have seen it here. So F is draw a suitable graph to represent the motion of the Ferris wheel uh, for one, revol one full revolution starting from the loading platform. So it's going to look something like this. Um, and we had that sketch out before. So remember, our minimum point is where we're starting. That's approximately two. Our maximum point up here is by 46. Our midway here. Um, is 24 so it's probably just in around there and we can work through it full revolution took six minutes so that is our period of our function 
the part G, if a person rides the Ferris wheel, what height will they be after two minutes? So let's take our function that we worked out in part E. So from part E, we worked out our function F of T is equal to 24 minus 22 cos of pi over 3t. And we are working where t is equal to 2 minutes. So we sub that in. So we're doing f of 2 is 24 minus 22 cos of pi over 3 times 2. And that will give us, when we work it out, 35 meters. That was actually worth 10 marks. Now, bear in mind, if you messed up on E, you picked the wrong function, you have the wrong values, and um, as long as you're doing your substitution here to whatever you had on E, you will have, um, you will get all your marks. So it's really important that even if you think, oh, it's not right, that you keep going with it because they will only penalize you once for a wrong answer as long as there's no oversimplification.